welcome to the final round of the World University Debate Workshop. Here at the World Debate Institute. We have four outstanding teams who are joining us uh, for today's debate. Uh, I would like to thank you all for attending. We have quite a number of judges who will be adjudicating uh, this round. Our round will be chaired by Debbie Newman of Cambridge University. I've asked Debbie if she would chair the debate as if she was in the, in the debating chamber back at Cambridge. So we get a taste of it here in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, thanks to you all for a great week of debating that we've had with each other. But let's do it one more time. With that in mind, I'll hand the gavel over to Debbie. Okay, call this house to order. Welcome to this debate on the motion, this house would place security cameras in public areas of city centres. <coughs> on the first proposition team today, we have Emily and Ethan, and on the second proposition team, we have Josh and Kelly. Please welcome them. Josh and oh, sorry, Josh and Mandy. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> on the opposition team today, we have Rich and Garrett speaking for the first opposition team and Darius and Scott speaking for the second opposition team. Please welcome them. <laughs> Speeches today will be of seven minutes in length with the first and last minute protected from points of information. The noise that you will hear once at one minute, once at six minutes, and twice at seven minutes from our timekeeper, Steve, is... <laughs> okay. Um, and if there are no further questions at this time, it gives me great pleasure to recognise Emily to propose the motion that stands in her name. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to open this debate on this important topic of installing video cameras in public areas of city centres. I'd like to begin by uh, defining the motion. We are going to define video cameras, basically as you all think of them, surveillance devices that record, monitor, um, pretty much a given. City center we are going to define as main intersections and roads. Um, these, um, and now I'm going to move on to our plan and then continue on to our, my two points, one of which is that a government has an obligation to protect its people, the second of which is safety. Starting out um, with our plan. The plan is to install video surveillance units at major intersections. At each of these intersections, there will be two cameras, one of which will be surveilling speeding, will be surveilling the traffic that is going through said intersection, the second of which will be doing a sweep of the block that it is on to watch for pedestrian crimes. Um, not at this time, sir. Um, Within my, my own city, we have a blue light system. Under each blue light, there is a camera that sweeps the, the street that it is on. This is in Baltimore, Maryland. The, it, creates, it creates surveillance that the police can, can look to in case in the issue of a crime so that they can see who may be perpetrating said crime once it has been reported. And if it isn't reported, they can see that it is still going on. It will, for those people who are afraid to go to the police because they are afraid of being looked, no thank you sir, being looked down on or accused of something um, that are, let's say a woman is raped off and she feels that it is her fault that she feels ashamed because she wasn't strong enough to protect herself. The police will be able to see this crime going on. They will see that this is happening. They can perhaps locate her, go to her, say, you know, you shouldn't be ashamed about this. They can take action to stop said crimes. No thank you sir. Um, the, these blue lights within my city have decreased crime. They've led to the comprehension of criminals and have made the streets ultimately safer. Yes, sir. Have they decreased crime on the whole or just in that area? They have decreased crime in the city, as that's where the video cameras are located. Okay. Yes, sir. Is voyeurism a crime? <laughs> I'm not sure. I guess it would be, but uh, here, here. it would depend on what you what you mean by voyeurism. Um, there are currently monitoring facilities in many private private industries and in many private buildings. Um, this is not taking taking this to a, an extreme step. This is in a public facility. You can't expect to have privacy when you're on a public street. Now, 
On to my main point, starting with the government has, must protect people, it's their duty. What's the point of a government if it can't even protect its own citizens from crimes? If, I mean, if everyone gets murdered, who are they supposed to be there, who are they supposed to govern? Um, in addition, they have the, an obligation to use the technology available. This is not, not anything new. When fingerprinting came out, when g DNA um, genetics issues came out, they used this to apprehend criminals. They have, they have an obligation to use the available technology, no thank you sir, which, increase it, which includes <coughs> video surveillance. Now, my second point is safety. These cameras will increase safety in two ways. It will cut back on pedestrian crime as well as speeding crime. And no, I'm not just talking about speeding, I'm talking about accidents. But you have to look about people who speed tend to be reckless drivers. They increase accidents. And apprehending them in pointing out that they have, have had some misguided issue, or misguided issue, that they are, they are driving recklessly. Um, they are in the system, they are seen, they are less likely, they are more likely to stop speeding, which means they are less likely to have an accident and hurt people. Now onto the pedestrian crime. Knowing that there's a camera out there that could be watching you means that you're going to be a lot less likely to mug the nice old lady walking down the street in front of you. Quite frankly, if there's a higher chance, no thank you sir, that you're going to be caught, you are less likely to commit that crime. You're less likely to do that on a public street, which increases safety for you know, the old ladies, the young women, the young men walking down that street going home from a club late at night. It's going to increase safety for the pedestrian. Yes, sir. So you're talking about the little old lady walking down the street. Does that mean that you're trying to categorize people and viewing some with different suspicion than others? I'm not looking at anyone under a different suspicion. I'm simply stating that little old women are easier targets for people to harm than it is a jacked up man of 25. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, to just to summarize what I was talking about, a city center, a main intersection, two cameras looking at traffic violations as well as looking at um, pedestrian activity. Um, these cameras would not be used to, to stalk people. They would not be used to, to watch people run, walk from point A to point B. They would be simply used in the case of, a, in the case of crimes. They'd be used to, yes, sir. Um, does the government side not agree that if these cameras were all in place and there, the police had a suspicion that someone was committing a crime in progress between many intersections, that this person cannot be followed by these cameras? And could those people not also be followed by an undercover police officer? You're simply taking away the manpower that that would take and putting into a technology that would use that, that would make it, that mean that that police officer could be attending a crime that's already been reported than stalking some guy who might be committing a crime. It means that you don't have to take that man and move him from what doing, doing, apprehending someone who's already committed a crime, and it means that they can use that surveillance to to perhaps follow that individual who they suspect of a crime. Now, my point has been that the government must protect people. They have an obligation to do this. As citizens within their, within their jurisdiction, they have a right, they have a necessity to protect us and to use the available technology to do so. They must use what they have available to, you're out of order, sir. They must do that to you. They must use the technology to keep their citizens safe. And safety is my second point. It will make the street safer. It will mean that you feel more comfortable walking down the street because you're not worried that some guy is going to jump out from behind a building and try and mug you. Um, it means that people will feel safer. It means and that there will be less traffic violations, less accidents, because people will be aware that these cameras are following them. Within my own city, this is already in effect and it has been effective. We urge you for these reasons to vote for the gun side. Thank you. indeed for her speech. Um, I respectfully ask the audience to make sure they keep um, their voices down um, while the speeches are going on and it gives me great pleasure to recognise Rich to open the case for the opposition.
educators, ma'ams, and sirs, each and every one of you have now been enrolled in a reality show, but unfortunately you have no choice in that matter. And the prize is we're going to now know everything you're going to be, your driving habits, and we're going to know about your sex habits at these driving intersections, but what we are inhibited from. Do you want that on the news? Bad boys, bad boys, what you going to do when we fake come for you? Okay. So here we go. Now, there are some serious issues, and I have three of them, but I'm, I will refute. But we're going to talk, number one, with this plan, is that crime will shift. Number two is, is there will be a complete loss of privacy. And number three, we're going to talk about money, police. They're the most, uh, most outstanding people to do this. And we're going to show how the police are actually corrupt and do, we want them to monitor this. But let's go down to city centers. She defines city centers as just main intersections on the road. I'm going to say that status quo already does this um, in major cities. Why are you going to enact them when this is a every major city? Okay, so first of all, I'm going to say that they have to cross an inherent barrier with their plan, and we already do this, except maybe my city, Cookville, which doesn't even have a main intersection. So that's going to be really interesting. Um, and so I, I just, I have a, a real uh, I asked the next speaker, is this going to be in every single city and every single intersection? I would like to know that because all she said is she gave an example of Burlington, which is a wonderful and fine city, and I encourage everyone to come here next year. But let's go on to this plan. They are going to install a major intersection, intersection traffic sweeps. First of all, we already have these in cities, so are they going to take those down and put theirs up? Or are they going to have an integrated system with all these other cities? I'm really confused about this. And then I want to know what cities don't have this, okay? So, uh, like Cookville, for example, but all major cities already have this. So if you vote for them, you, you, nothing will happen, nothing will change. You, and so we're going to say that uh, actually we need to uh, take action. Yes, ma'am, I would love to take your point. Did you not hear the point that I had about how there would be an additional camera that would sweep the surveillance that's around there? Okay, so instead of one camera on a red light, we're just going to have one right below it and have two. Um, Wow, so that, that camera doesn't work, and now you're gonna have a quagmire. What camera do you look at, okay? Uh, that, doesn't really, that doesn't really make sense to me. They, uh, yes, sir? I'd like to point out to the gentleman that usually when you have two surveillance cameras in the same place, they're pointed in different directions. Well, okay, that, that's fine, but what we're gonna, what my point, my second point will be, my first point will be the crime shifts, but I need to get going down to this. And then they say criminal in cities. Okay, how many people are committing crimes at the city intersections versus the whole city? I would like a number, okay? And then number two, if you get in a wreck in your car, obviously you're not just gonna walk up in the middle of an intersection by yourself. You're gonna be in an automobile and we have enforcement for this already. Now what's going on to the government duty to protect crime and it's an obligation and she gives a fingerprint. Well that's completely different than just looking at something and I'm actually going to say that actually this, this really doesn't apply. And then she says increasing safety. I'm going to say they're actually going to hurt safety by 10% minimum. And the reason why is that if I know as a criminal that all, all, the only way that they're going to do this is at an intersection, a busy intersection, I'll just go to the park across the street and do the crime, okay? And so they don't actually, they're actually going to increase safety. And we now know the focus is going to be on the intersection and not the public parks. Please tell me how that's going to increase the safety. I think the intent of the person that made the resolution, not this time, Mandy, I'll ask later. I'll answer your question later. So, and then they said about a, an old woman, they are stereotyping people that only the old women cross the street. We need to work about the, the drug addicts, we need to be people that are raped and the, the main points of the city. But let's go on to our point, our uh, opposition. The first main point was my third, but now it's my first, is that the crime shifts. Criminals are crafty. They're what we're called clandestines. Criminals are very smart, and they also know that, okay, if there's a camera right here, let's say that's there, I can just go over here. But they're not solving that. So even if it's two ways, I can just move around, and I can still do my crime in an intersection. And number two, criminals are smart. They're not going to do it in a main thoroughfare where everyone's watching. They're not going to do crack deals on, uh, let's say, 640 or the major airports. They're going to go somewhere they're not seen, and that's where the problem lies, not at intersections, okay? And then also, we had a huge, huge problem in America with NSA with the wiretapping, and then now, guess what? We were in debates last year, we were saying how it's going to happen and something else, no, not this time, sir, that it's going to escalate. This is a great example of how a slippery slope argument happens. Now we're finished with wiretapping, and now we're going to put cameras up and find more about you. What's next? Is this the last time you're going to want to know more information on us? Yes, sir. I would like to remind the gentleman, since the Patriot Act has been enacted, there has not been a terrorist attack on U.S. soil, so obviously it's working. Uh, no, it's right. not. No, that, that's a shameful argument because we're talking about terrorism in each and every one of us. When a woman gets raped, that's terrorism. When a woman uh, has to worry about a drunk driver 
um, doing that. That's terrorism. Not this time, I'm sorry. That's what we need to focus on, and that's the heart of the issue, not stopping speeders on a lady. That is important, but there are a lot more serious issues. Oh, boy, yes, man. Yes, Ms. Mandy. <laughs> okay, so your point on crime shifting. If all of a sudden the crime shifts to the park, which may happen, now can't we go there and have our police power there instead of having to spread out our police power? No, 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 that's actually not true, because now you're going to have two cameras, which is going to have to be enforced, and they're going to totally uh, be at the intersections, and they're going to completely ignore the parks. And that's what we're saying, is that they're, they're going to be more worried about this intersection and this new policy that you're having. No, we're actually saying that's not, unless, you, unless your plan hires more police, unless your plan uh, gives more money, which it doesn't, you're using the same amount of police and adding a whole new program, and that's where the flaws of the system is. How many people and how many police are you going to add? We never, There's nothing. So we have to assume you're just going to overwork the police, which is going to lead me to my police corruption down below. But let's talk about uh, the, pri uh, the uh, crime shift and that we're going to move from cities and enforcement. I would like to know, does each and every one of us wear a license, license plate on the back of our things? No. And so uh, how are you going to enforce? Are we going to have uh, face recognition from every single person? If I see that talk, uh, no, no, not this time. If I see that pretty girl walking down the street and I think she's smoking a cigarette, but yet it's a marijuana, how do I know it's her? I might go over here to this pretty blonde and arrest her. Please show me how you can recognize people in a camera. I need, we need some more information. Do we have the technology of face recognition? And then that would feed to my privacy, loss of privacy. The big brother, which is, the big brother's always watching us. And now we have cameras, what's next? And then, no, I think I'm in protected time. But my third thing is police corruption. We already had this now, and now we're gonna have police sitting behind a little desk watching a camera, and then watching every move we think. I think there's better people and better ways to monitor and enforce this, but now you're gonna have police Bob that has no training in this whatsoever, sitting behind a desk, and is now gonna be enforcing to this. Would you like that? Do you think, would that make you feel safe? I don't think so. If you think that would make you feel safer, that your intersections might might be safer, but you can go right down the street and get mugged because you know that's not going to be a patrol. That's not safety. In conclusion, <laughs> sorry, I caught that. In conclusion, vote for the opposition. <laughs> <laughs> very much indeed for his speech and it's with great pleasure that I recognize Ethan to continue the case for the proposition. Going to be going 24 hours a day. What kind of old lady 
I'm sorry, we're trying to protect the old lady. I know you, in your paranoia, you have a problem with that, but that's what we're trying to do. The old ladies um, aren't going to go to the park at 12 o'clock at night to walk through, okay? We need city centers that are monitored so that at late at night, when the criminals come out, there can be a safe place for people to walk through. That's the whole point. There's not going to be a crime ship to get the old ladies, sure. So you said people can walk around. What are city centers? You said they're intersections. By your own definition, what are, what, please define city center. The city center definition is a troublesome one. I don't think we should be penalized for not being able to define it because we really don't think that it has any clear definition. But we believe that our definition of main, um, main thoroughfares that the cities themselves would define it's not going to be an integrated system. We believe that that's probably the best definition we can come up with um, as our side. And um, you can debate that that's bad if you want. OK, so on to the next point they have, um, which is a slippery slope. Let's talk about that one. They say that this is going to lead to some Orwellian society. It's going to be a step-by-step -step process of creating a police state. However, um, we already have a model for putting cameras into cities, and that's um, Great Britain. Uh, in Great Britain, there's already millions of cameras all over the place uh, watching people, and England is not you know, a police state. People still live their lives. They have freedom. They can, uh, you know, they have political rights. It has no characteristics of the police state, and there's no reason to think that somehow in doing this in America um, would either. And um, also, on the, the, the issue of privacy, um, my first point would be that if you don't have anything to hide, um, then why should you be scared? And the second is that you really can't use the, the idea of privacy and uh, an idea of right, of pri right to privacy in this debate because uh, by you know, our definition, by the motion's definition, I should say, it's a public space. It's not a private space. Police officers can already see you with their eyes in public. Yeah, sure. So shouldn't you, as a private citizen, be able to go into a public place and know that you can carry out your daily lives without everyone in the world having to know about it and being broadcasted all across the government? It's not going to be broadcast all across the government. This isn't going to be on a television set that we beam to millions of homes across the world. I think you're paranoid, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And um, on their point about um, this will deter, the, um, this will reroute um, the capabilities of the police, and it'll, it'll take away from their capability. Um, there's not going to be a police officer sitting behind watching every camera. The point is that it's going to work um, you know, in, the, in the future to look at past events. Say, if there was a crime committed yesterday, then today you can go back and look at that crime. There's not going to be any face recognition software. Um, I, don't, I don't think we really even have that yet. That's not, that's not an issue. Um, uh, if someone's a known criminal, and they've been known to commit this sort of crime or that sort of crime, then it'll be much easier for the police to investigate this and to bring it to some sort of resolution. Um, so, yes, there, there's, no, there's no actual drawbacks. Um, this is going to make people feel safer, better about living in their community. The innocent people will be protected, rewarded by their access to their communities, while the guilty, the criminals, they will be the ones punished and the ones will be stopped. So, you, and uh, this will be funded by the, the uh, increased amount of speeding tickets that we take um, when they fly through the intersection of that old lady. I thank the speaker very much indeed. And
and it gives me great pleasure to call upon, in fact he's there already, uh, to continue the case for the opposition, Garrett. I'm very disappointed that the government spent more of their time attacking our demeanor and calling us paranoiacs instead of focusing on our argumentation and the flaws inherent in their plan. So going down this list, I'm going to go ahead and go ahead and reemphasize a little bit of what Rich has said, offer a little bit of refutation as, uh, off of what they've said, and really explain the deep, dark implications of their plan. Now, to expand off of what Rich said, when he meant there was a crime shift and that criminals are clandestine, perhaps he was suggesting that by merely only putting your cameras within public areas in the city centers, that not only will criminals become more crafty as to where and how they commit their crimes, but that they aren't actually going to no longer commit crime. They're just going to move to the area where there is no longer a camera. And that's really the issue we're trying to focus on here is you're not solving the crime issue. When I asked the government, is this going to stop crime outright, lower the percentages, or is it just going to move where the crime happens? The answer was, I don't know. Now that's a really big issue because, sit down. The whole reason why they're installing these cameras in the first place is to have a detrimental effect on crime. But the fact that they cannot even tell me whether or not this is going to stop crime, they're giving me a lot of what ifs. They're just saying, well, perhaps it'll be moved. I don't know. Perhaps it'll be stopped. Maybe. It's oh, no, really, please, really shameful. I'm still talking. It's really, really <laughs> shameful that they cannot give us a straight answer on this, that they're just suggesting that perhaps crime will stop, but they failed to answer my partner's point. Is it going to just shift? Yes. Are you suggesting that we should put more cameras elsewhere? Aren't you, isn't one of your main arguments that we shouldn't have, shouldn't have cameras? Hardly, and I'm gonna to get to that in a minute as to the severe moral implications of your policy. All right, going on further, you said this is going to result in safer pedestrian areas and safer speeding areas. The intersections already serve to protect these people. That's why there's stoplights there. That's why there's already a police presence there. That's why already many city centers have cameras. So we haven't really seen a severe impact of your plan. We haven't really seen a noticeable change. We haven't seen a measurable change. We haven't seen really anything that comes to benefit of this, except perhaps that you're allowing these criminals to become more craftier in their ways that they're evading surveillance. Now, I'm gonna move on to what we were talking about earlier about the dangers of this police state mentality, which he said we're going to be a little paranoid about. Well, the thing is, is yes, other places have uh, installed these things and other places have used them correctly, but we are living within a culture that has abused the powers that the people have given to the government. We gave the government powers to assist in these terrorist attacks. We gave the government the ability to make us safer, and what did they do with it? They went too far with it. They've broken the laws with it. They've undermined our rights with it. And given that we can see this historical precedence with it, what other logical conclusion can we come to that they're going to do it again? We gave them the ability to monitor terrorists. What do we have now? We have a terrorist watch list that has civil rights leaders on it. Don't you think that's a little bit too far? Sit down. We're looking at this, and we're going and, and seeing that we don't have a police state, but in effect, we actually do, because we've given the government the right to do these things, and they've pushed it beyond what we've allowed them to do. This is where we have a problem. We're not paranoid, but we do think the government has a severe fear-mongering program in place. They are, they are hinting at the idea that people are inherently flawed, and so we must monitor them daily. We must constantly be trying to protect them, because they can't protect themselves. Yes, sir. If you're not paranoid, why aren't you wearing shoes? <laughs> <laughs> what does my lack of shoes have to do with paranoia? I fail to see <laughs> the causality. I fail to see the logical connection. Perhaps by me not wearing shoes, oh, the aliens might come and give me my leather loafers. <laughs> <laughs> the government has a lack of argumentation. The government has a lack of logical connection. The government has a lack of reasons why they should do this. And when we point out the problems with their case, this is what they do. They don't want to acknowledge it. We tell them that there's something wrong. In fact, we show them that something's wrong. We've given them historical precedents for why these things have been abused in the past and why they should not be used now. But what have we offered in return? We've still offered, we've still had nothing but jokes. 
and lunacy from their side. We've got nothing but them trying to undermine the credibility of the negative's argument by trying to attack our characters, by trying to attack our demeanor, and that is wrong. So let me go ahead and summarize. My partner here was speaking of the ineffectiveness of this plan, how merely the crime is going to shift. The, cri the criminals are just going to become more clandestine, more, more covert, more sneaky, more crafty as to how they're going to commit these crimes. These security cameras aren't going to prevent crime in these areas. They're just going to encourage crime to move somewhere else. When we see that, we can see that, that their plan fails to address the actual harms in the first place. We see that they say, there's a lot of crime by putting up cameras. We'll stop the crime. But we don't, because we're merely just moving where the crime is going to be committed. Then when we say that these powers are going to be abused, but they say, no, they won't. See, it's already done in England. It's not getting abused there. Right, but we're putting these in the United States. And we've seen that every time we give the government an inch of power, they take a foot. Hell, right now they're taking about 10 to 15 feet. And when I look at that, I think that's just absolutely shameful, that the government has failed to include any of this within their plan. They failed to address these issues. In fact, they just ignore them. But that's the entire idea of their plan, is to ignore the inherent problems, to ignore what's actually going on. There's crime. Cool. Set up cameras. All right. It just went somewhere else. How do you solve for that? Oh, well, maybe we can put the police over there. Well, that's not what you said. You said that the police are going to be monitoring these tapes, and the police are going to be answering already calls, you know, calls that are already in effect. All right, well, we're all, I'm kind of getting lost where all the police are going. But maybe they can clarify that later. So in the, in the end, we're, we're really fostering a culture that is embarrassing. We're saying that we can't trust our people. But we've already shown we can't trust the government. Thank you, Garrett, very much indeed for that speech, and we now move uh, down to the second half of the table, and I give you great pleasure to recognize the next speaker on the proposition, Josh. Thank you. So I would like to start uh, by saying um, something, and then I'll go into uh, my reputation and then my argument, but the opposition team has come to the wrong school, the wrong university, and the wrong town to argue this camera issue. Because two years ago, a camera caught the killer of Michelle Gardner Quinn on camera. They identified him, they identified his clothing, they got his height and weight, and were able to expedite the, uh, the answer and, and the, and to her murder. Um, he was discovered, and now he's put away in jail for life. And that is sorely because a camera on a busy street corner videotaped him abducting her. So I ask you, I come here today to ask the House to, sit, to vote yes to place cameras in public city centers on these streets and on these main intersections. Uh, now I'll go into my refutation. Uh, I'm a very, no sir, I'm a little troubled by what the opposition has said, and I will continue on this path of labeling them as paranoid, because they are. Uh, one of them stood up here and said, well, we don't walk around with IDs taped to our back. Well, what about your ID card? You have a serial number on that ID card that identifies you. You get into your, your, your moving vehicle, which has a license plate, so yes, you are tracked by the government, and you are watched by the government. So yes, it is the government's duty to protect us from ourselves, uh, to ensure, no sir, they're they are here to ensure um, that people are being effective members of their society um, and to watch out for us. Um, so I don't know where your figures is about reducing crime rate without cameras by 10%, like you said before, but I think your figures are a little out of whack. And then the gentleman who stood here before said, oh, well, in England it works, it works, it works. Well, Yes, that's what we're trying to say here. And God forbid America takes a lesson from Europe here. I mean, they're in an economic growth. Their architecture is amazing. They continue growing. They have vast tourism. Their crime rate is very low. And they're on the euro. So, you know, God forbid, sir, that we take a, a lesson from, from Europe. So, now, no, sir, sit down, please. Now, I would like to go into something that hasn't been addressed at all in this debate. Cameras can also prove your innocence. They can work both ways. Did you all know that? They can prove your innocence. 
Uh, today, I woke up as I always do and I turned on CNN. First thing I saw on CNN was that yesterday in New York City, a male, an African American male, about 25 years old, was walking down the street, iPod. You know, he was jiving and dancing a little bit. But to the cops who socially profiled the man, they thought he was drunk and a disturbance to the public. So you know what they did? They came over to him with their nightsticks and beat this man. He is now in the hospital in critical condition. And this was all caught on camera. So the cameras can help catch corrupt police officers. They can help catch the government when they're breaking the law as well. They go both ways. Yes, sir. Both examples you've given were cameras not from intersections on streets and roads. Uh, New York City is buildings? all intersections, sir. Have you been to New York City? Yes, it's I all have. intersections. So yes, it, it did help in this situation. <laughs> I just don't get it. I'm very in trouble where you guys are coming from. Yes, sir. Um, do you think that people uh, are capable of suspicion and having suspicion uh, drive what they do? Based on the well, yeah, well, you're talking about suspicion, so let's take the black man in. They have suspicion about this man, but it's clear he has his headphones in, and he's dancing down the street. So, yeah, that sends a pretty normal signal to me that I need to go over with my nightstick and beat the living hell out of him. No, sir. So, yes, uh, they, the cameras work both ways. But let me also ask you another question here. Do we really want to live in an unsafe and an unsecure society? Because clearly, I think that's what the opposition has come here today, to, to advocate. Let's live in an unsafe society. Let's live in a place where there aren't cameras that can prove evidence of a cop hurting an African-American male, or in another situation, the granny that they're talking about, her purse is stolen. Yes, this can provide evidence. Um, it can provide an alibi. About a year ago, there was a famous show on the channel HBO, Curb Your Enthusiasm. And in the stadium, outside of the stadium in Los Angeles at Dodger Stadium, a man was caught on camera. He was also caught on film by HBO. This man was accused of murdering his wife. He was at the baseball game when his wife was murdered. That was his alibi, but they had no proof. Finally, after going to the cameras, they saw him on camera, and then they called HBO because the man remembered. He said, oh, yes, there was a, I remember there was a TV show being filmed there that day. They looked back on the records. The man was proved innocent, and he was let free. So yes, in this situation, cameras in busy street sections and on streets are welcomed by this house. And, and, and when you're driving down a busy intersection, you know, I'm from Denver, Colorado. I live in a neighborhood called Greenwood Village, and they have cameras on the intersections. And if you're speeding, no, sir. If you're speeding, it will catch you. It will take a picture of your license plate and you in the car so that it can tell that it's you. So we already have this in mainstream society. This is not something new that the public is used to. And also in regards to, to bringing up, this is not going to be like communist Russia or, or 1984, where the governments are watching the people to make sure they don't rise up against the government. This, these cameras are put in place to ensure our safety. No, sir, no, sir. Uh, to ensure our safety, to ensure the mother's safety who takes her children for a walk down the street, to ensure that if a grandmother, the one that the paranoid opposition keeps talking about, gets her, her purse moved, you know, uh, stolen, it would have to take a friendly person on the street to call 911 to get the cops on their way over to help that granny. But we could see 10, 15 minutes here. If the cameras catch it, they could have already called in the police. So I asked this house to give a yay vote to place cameras in public city centers. Um, we cannot violate our moral implication to help out our fellow man. This, this stabs our fellow man in the back by not doing this. This can prove our innocence. It can prove someone who's guilty. It can help solve a crime. It can help identify a criminal. And yes, let's face it, when there's cameras around, you act a little bit better because you don't want to get caught on candid camera. So this house, please give a yay vote to putting cameras on the I thank Josh very much for that speech and I now call upon Darius to continue the case of the opposition.
think there's nobody watching, but there's always someone watching. Maybe you're thinking, I've got nothing to hide. I'm a good person. I don't commit crimes. I follow the law. Millions of other people buy it as well, just as you do. But guess what? You've been fooled. Did, were you watching her when I walked up to her, when I was looking behind her ear a little bit, when I was watching her? She was being watched for five seconds. Did you see how nervous she got? People do not want to be watched. No one wants to be watched. First, I'm going to go into my, a bit of refutation, and then I'm going to go into my two extensions. My two extensions are first, pink zebras and the destruction of individualism. And second, the, person, the loss of personal touch of law enforcement. So first, for my reputation. First, I'd like to, uh, uh, I'd like to point out a little bit of uh, uh, a little mix-up that the first government position had. Uh, the first government speaker came up and said, uh, suspected criminals can be followed on cameras by sweeping the streets and monitoring, po monitoring possible crimes. Then the second government walked up, contradicted the first government speaker and said, the cameras will not be actively watched. So I ask you, who will you believe? There are two problems with this that came out. The first problem is that the government side is not even consistent about what it wants to do. How will it put a plan in place when it, uh, to watch people, to put in these cameras in place, when it does not know what it wants to do? And secondly, suspicion can lead to extra surveillance. When you are suspicious about something, when you are suspicious about a possible crime, it can lead to extra surveillance. And I will explain to you today how this can lead to the downfall of our society as we know it. Um, uh, the, the, government, the, the second government talked about how we're watched anyway, uh, license plates were followed, the Patriot Act, we're watched anyway. So what, should we give up all of our civil liberties just because we're being watched a little bit? Should we give in to such dangerous possibilities? Also, there are other arguments made. We'll have safer streets, crime will go down, uh, innocent people may be proven innocent. Maybe it's possible, but maybe not. I want you to remember that as I go into my, uh, my extensions. And you will see how my disadvantages so far outweigh these possible advantages that will cost so much money, as the first opposition side has pointed out, that they will not be worth it at all. Did you not recognize when my partner said that they wouldn't be actively watched, that perhaps if they know the criminal's movements and they start to watch him, that then a personnel will be put there to watch the camera? No, I did not recognize that. What I recognized is one person, one person is saying they will be actively watched, and when they're suspicious of a crime, they will watch, and the other one said they will not be actively watched. So I don't know what's going on. That's all I'm saying. Okay? So now, I'd like to move on to my first exemption, extension, pink zebras and the destruction of individualism. As I showed you in my little experiment walking around this room, we do not want to be watched based on those awkward reactions. What does this lead to? People, there is a suspicion against what is not the norm. So if I'm not sitting up normally, if, I'm, if I have to scratch myself, if I have to take care of something, this suspicion will lead me to act differently. This suspicion will also lead to people um, lead to uh, the government suspicion. As the, as the government side has pointed out, a little old lady is not going to be, we're not going to worry about a little old lady committing a crime. But a buff 25-year-old man, maybe. Maybe we should be worried about that. So what will this will cause is a black man driving a nice car. May, it might be a little bit rare in this society. But, but black men are coming out because of our biases. Maybe he'll be pulled over more. You know? All right? What this will lead to is a homogenized society. People will begin to act the same. If you think that your different behavior, if you think that, um, you, that your different way of acting, uh, your different life choices will cause people to be more suspicious of you, what you will do is act the same as others. Yes, Where sir? in this debate have we, the, the government, challenged the status quo like you're talking about? Where in this debate? I don't understand your question. I don't understand what you're categorizing as the status quo. You should be more specific next time. Um, 
So what, this homo what will happen with this homogenized society? I'm going to go more into this. People will stop doing cultural things, which will draw suspicion. People will stop wearing do rags because that's a that's kind of that's a bit of a black gangster connotation, and it, it, it may be you might think someone who's wearing a do rag might be a criminal. Middle Easterners will watch out, stop practicing their culture because of the problem of being different. People will try to act the same. If everyone is in one room is wearing a white shirt. Will you wear a black shirt? No, because you don't want to stand out there. People do not want to be different. People are scared. Out of order. So this brings me to my example of the pink zebras. The pink, the, the, um, uh, uh, scientists painted a bunch of zebras pink, and they wanted to watch in the morning what would happen with these zebras. They, the next morning they woke up, and all the zebras were dead. The lions killed them. What does this show us? If you stand out in a society that is, that, that is watching you, it's going to lead to big problems. You don't want to stand out. Standing out is dangerous. So this leads me to the final extension of my example, 1984. Uh, it was alluded to, alluded to by the last speaker. If we all act by societal norms, if we're scared to go away from societal norms, that will mean that we are all going to try to act the same. And who sets our societal norms? The government. So when the government decides that this is what we, this is how people should act, this is how people should act, by outlawing prostitution, they're saying prostitution is wrong. By outlawing sm smoking in bars, they're saying that smoking is bad for you. If the government decides they can set your societal norms, the danger of that is a homogenized society, and that's why I say we should reject. Thank you, Darius, very much indeed for his speech. And it would be a great pleasure to call upon Mandy to summarize the case of the proposition. <laughs> <laughs> There's been very few times in my debate career where I'm excited to speak after a speaker, but this happens to be one of those times. <laughs> because that speech was so ludicrous and so outlandish that this is actually going to be entertaining for me and hopefully for you for a respond. First of all, I'm going to do a little bit of reputation, and then I'm going to get into the big basic questions of this debate. How I'm going to boil this down is in three ways. The first of which, the distinction between the public and private sphere. The second way, the role of the government and the boundaries of. And the third way, the effectiveness of this as a tool for protection. So first of all, I'll do a little bit of reputation. He talks about, well, he says he has two arguments, but he really only has one because he fails to get to his second argument. But his first argument is the pink zebras. Hmm. He says cameras will make people act differently, and then he says that we're going to have a homogenized society and use as evidence, uh, as 1984 as evidence. Okay, so actually, as my partner spent half of his speech talking about, is this is actually what's going to protect people from having to become homogenized. As it is right now, people have to, people are afraid to wear those do-rags and everything like that because they don't have those cameras as a form of protection to prove false suspicion, right? The, this protects from false suspicion. We say by putting up cameras that we can actually, uh, we, that people won't have to change their ways and change their cultural differences and anything like that. And second of all, where is your link, sir? I, I, I don't know if you, if, were you in Steve's speech of the, of the causation and correlation argument? Uh, you totally lack any causation. This is, a, you're without link. There is not going to be a homogenous society because there's already the cameras up. As your first speaker of your entire bench said, this is the status quo, this is already happening. So if that's true, wouldn't we already be living in a modernized society? And we're not. So there is not much of a link, and this is a huge, huge fallacy. Second of all, I'd like to get into how I'm gonna break this overall debate down. And the first way is the distinction between the public and the private sphere. What the opposition fails to recognize that we do give up a lot of our rights when we enter into the public sphere. And there's good reason for this. The reason is, is because when we're in the public, it's a whole different ballgame. It's not just about me anymore. It's about me and the other. It's about my interaction with other people. And we think it's a good investment as the government and as anyone else in the world does to invest in that protection against one another. And that's what we, why we do have driver's license. That's why we do have identification cards. That's why we do have uh, the possibility for the issue warrants to go in a home and search and seizure. We even violate that public or that private sphere because um, we violate that public or that private sphere in many cases because we think that it's worthwhile as the overall society and for protection, but I'll take you rich. Yes, Mandy, are you encouraging everyone in this room just to stay in their house and not leave? Absolutely not. 
But we do it already. We already, when we leave our house, we give up a lot of our rights. And we think that's a really good thing. We think that that inherently is part of the societal contract that we sort of enter in and entering into a state and into a government. We also say that the slippery slope argument doesn't fall here. Right? I mean, one of the first arguments that the opposition bench made was the fact that, oh, we're putting up cameras on the streets? Oh my god, now we're going to put up cameras everywhere and yada yada yada. But then their other argument, which I think Emily tried to point this out on point of information, was this crime shift, right? This is an internal contradiction of their points. They're saying, oh, well, you know, now the crime is going to move to the parks. Are you suggesting now we put up the cameras in the parks? No. We are recognizing on, on the government bench a balance, a compromise between that. Role. We do recognize that, that people don't want to be watched all the time, as Darius pointed out, but we also think that it's important to watch those people so we can prove the innocents are guilty when crime is involved, and that's what we do every day as a government, and we think that's a pretty darn important thing. Second of all, the role of the government, right? What is the role of the government? Its purpose is to protect people, and sometimes we do have to step outside of what we would consider the norm uh, of boundaries. We do have to recognize that the government does have to, it has to overstep you know, what we would consider normal. You know, with the, uh, with, in the case of 9-11, this came up in one point during the debate with the, with the Patriot Act, right? A situation arose, and we had to react as a government. And we think, actually, the possibility of a government being able to react to that situation and overstep its boundaries is a good thing. And we don't want to limit that possibility. We don't want to take that away from our government. We do want our government to respond to exactly what's going on in society and, and solve the problems in that way, Darius. Don't you think that uh, suspicion can be a problem, like with regards to the Patriot Act, whatever? For example, I go to an airport and I am always taken into airport security because of the color of my skin and the way I look. Okay, I understand your suspicion argument, and this is actually a great segue into my third point, the effectiveness of this as a tool of protection. Now, my partner's entire extension was based on the fact that this is not only going to protect the guilty from, or rather, convict the guilty of crime, but this is going to protect the innocent. Now, we say if you go into an airport, we'll use your example, although we're not talking about airports, we are still talking about main intersections, but say we were, for instance, say we were talking about airports. If you go into an airport and you are unjustly always brought into security, you can use the film footage from these cameras that we would put up and say, look, this is always happening to me. This is a tool for you now. This is a tool for the judge. This is a tool for the impoverished. This is the, a tool for the disenfranchised, the people, as my partner used the example, the man who did nothing wrong and was let off because he did nothing wrong, because it was on film. So we think that this is really important. So how is this going to serve as a tool of effectiveness? Now, well, a lot of the argument throughout the opposition bench was that this is not going to be effective at all because crime will shift and the cameras just cannot simply cover enough. But we say that's not enough reason to reject the plan. Yes, you're right, this isn't going to stop every single crime everywhere in the world, but it's going to do something. And that's why people across the United States and across the world, such as in England, have put on these video cameras because they recognize that this is a good decision that does have the possibility to solve crime. Well, thank you. And we think that um, is this that there's just simply that the opposition bench just doesn't give you enough reason not to do this. On the, uh, we're, we've made it explicitly clear that we're not violating your rights, and that we've also made it explicitly clear that when you're in the public sphere, it's a whole different ballgame anyway. And we've also said that even if there's a one percent chance that we stop a crime, that we solve a rape case, that we get off a man who is innocent then that's enough reason to do it. Because they just haven't given enough. The fact that it might not work is not enough reason to do it. Because we say that it's always a reason to try. And that's what we're trying to do on the government bench. We are trying. And the opposition has tried and failed to prove why that's not worth it. So in conclusion, simply breaking this debate down, what it comes down to is protection, security, and the role of the government. And if you as all adjudicators feel that we inside government have done our job in protection, providing security, and not overstepping, but stepping just enough as a role of the government, then you have to vote for government. And until the opposition, until the final speaker gets up here, and he's got a lot of work to do, if he's going to do this, <laughs> if he gets up here and he has, if he can say that we violate all those things and we just don't do enough, then so be it. But I strongly believe that's impossible. <laughs>
want to talk about what's happening today because we have these two conflicting values. Privacy, security. They seem mutually exclusive. Which one are we to attain? How are we to do it? Which one's going to work better? What should we hold dear to our society? But let me let you think about this. You cannot have security without privacy. With this type of impersonal surveillance that the government is advocating, we are endangering ourselves because we are placed under constant suspicion. The enemy now comes from the enemy. It now comes from those who have pledged to protect us. We are now at the mercy of those who have put in place to protect us. And that is not the role of this government. That is not what the government should do. So to break down this debate, and to crystallize it for you. There have been three main areas that we have heard arguments on both sides combat and see the feasibility of this plan. We had first, like I said, the feasibility of this policy. The second, the idea of trust. Can we trust our government this far? And third, we have the homogenization of our culture, of our society, Yes. Haven't we shown that these cameras can also hold the government liable for when they break the law? That brings up a great point, which I was going to make later. But should we be placing these corrupt police officers in uh, control of our cameras? Say they were caught by them, but there's nothing to fix the corruption in our system. So we're now going to give them more power and let them sit behind the cameras where they cannot be overtly seen on the streets. No, thank you. So first we heard about feasibility, and we had these feasibility arguments. And we talked about how the plan is not inherent from the first government, which brilliantly points out the fact that it's already happening, but they're just looking to reassert that this idea might help in some way more. We also talked about how crime will move. This plan doesn't solve anything. It's going to make more crime because it's predictable where the government is putting their emphasis on fighting crime. We know where they're looking now, on the intersections. So it's going to move elsewhere. We can dodge the cameras, but we can't dodge a man on the street who's walking around, who can see people's faces, hear what's going on, know what's happening, look into people's eyes face to face and be able to judge what is truly going on. Yes, I'll take it. And who's to say that an officer's patrols would instead have, instead of having to spread out over a large area, would they could focus on the areas that aren't covered by these? That there would be more men in those areas where these crimes would shift? That's not relevant because we're saying that all these cameras do is put emphasis in the wrong place. It's just shifting it more. Because you're still going to need resources to man these cameras, to pay attention to these cameras, and no longer is enforcement, enforcement enforcement becomes too predictable. We know where they're looking, so let's go somewhere else. And that is the important part about the feasibility arguments. No, thank you. Next, we talked about the principle of trust. How much can we trust our government? And since it's come to the, the debate looking at the United States, can we really trust the United States government more to have this kind of power over us? Absolutely not. We have seen with the Patriot Act how it came with, a, with the principle of security, but now we've seen it invade our private li lives because of this paranoia, this justification that no longer we, can we trust our people, that we have to, no thank you, that we have to look deep inside every nook and cranny of our culture to see what seems out of place. It allows the government to be more covert now we have the impersonal security. We have people behind security cameras. They're no, no longer on the street, subject to, our so, to act in a socially acceptable manner. They can be voyeurs. And voyeurism, as it was pointed out by the first government, is a crime. So let's just perpetuate a new crime, now committed by our own government, by those who are in power, who are, can escape any consequences that type of power. Yes, ma'am. On one hand, you say that these cameras are, are not going to be effective and that crime's going to move. But on the other hand, you're saying they're so powerful that it's going to invade our private life. What is it? Exactly. They're invading the private lives. They're invading the good people. They're not out getting the bad people. They're just looking for what's different. What is good about our culture? That we are a different, diverse culture. And that's the problem. And we're putting the wrong people behind these cameras and we're perpetuating more crime, new crime, voyeurism. And now, on to peak zebras. No, thank you. First of all, they, the government has mischaracterized my partner's argument. 
saying that uh, since we already on the, fir the first table said that cameras are everywhere, and next that we're talking about the new cameras, but we're talking about the overt action of this government now having a uniform policy across all of the space, saying that cameras must be on every street corner before it was up to the city to decide. Now it is an overt step by the government to put them everywhere, and this is the link. This is the link that causes all the problems, the homogenization of our society, because now the overarching body of our culture now states that it is okay to watch and it is okay to see everything that is happening in our private lives where we go to do our daily activities. So look at the first government's POIs we, we, that we, we asked of the first government. Voyeurism is a crime, but that we're gonna look for a jacked up man, a jacked up man under 25. And this is exactly what happens. Remember the pink zebras. We painted the zebras pink to see how they would interact socially with other zebras, but what we found is they didn't make it through the night. They were the ones sought out by the lions and attacked and killed by the lions viciously in the night. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to leave you with that image. And also, everyone's wearing a black shirt. Are you willing to wear a white shirt? This homogenization will lead to the demise of our culture. We are a diverse people who value differences, but now this overarching overt policy will deny those differences and force us to be the same as everyone else so that we do not stand out, so that we do not look any different than everyone else, so that we can escape this problem, a problem for our society. So I urge you, this is why the government wins, or the opposition. Why you must, <laughs> you know, why you must oppose this policy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to call before I have to make a decision about which team you think won the debate, uh, which is a decision about, as we said, the kind of quality of arguments. Let's actually have a vote on the motion on whether or not you do or don't believe that we should have security cameras um, in city centres and the public areas of city centres. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask those of you who support the motion to say aye and those who uh, uh, reject the motion to say nay. Okay, so firstly, those who agree with the proposition that we should introduce and place cameras, security cameras, into public areas of city centres, please say aye. Aye. And those who agree with the opposition that we should not say nay. No. Oh, okay, I can't tell by that, so I'm going to need to do a count by a um, show of hands. Um, at this point, it would actually be a division through the lobbies if you can't tell by acclamation. Uh, but if we don't have any lobbies, we'll do hands. So could you put your hands up, please, if you support the proposition? Okay, and if you support your <laughs> position? This is not who win the debate, guys. That's what we personally say. Yeah. Okay, so on the issue of the motion, not only won the debate, but on the yeah. issue of the motion, this motion is defeated. This House does not believe that we should have security count. Uh, By 10 to 11. Okay, but yeah, now what we're going to ask you to do is to fill in your ballot. You're now not thinking about your own opinions on this issue. We're now asking you to think about who you think came first, second, third, and fourth in the debate based on.